continuing with Stephen Ward. Dr. Stephen Ward, after which we, were going, we are going to move on to the case of Buster Crab. Missile crisis is the heading. The Secretary of for War had followed up his first encounter with Christine Keeler with alacrity, L-A-A-L-A-C-R-I-T-Y. -A -A he called to see her at Ward's flat and had sexual intercourse with her on several occasions. Meanwhile, Avinov was also seeing Keeler. He met her often at Ward's flat, but any sexual relationship they had was fleeting. On one or two occasions, he narrowly mi miss missed meeting Pufumo as one arrived and the other left, and this was a source of considerable amusement to Ivanov and Keela. <coughs> One evening, when Ivanov, Ward and Keeler were together, so these three were together, Ward lightly suggested to her, why don't you ask Jack when the Germans are going to get the bomb? So Ward asked her, why don't you ask Jack when the Germans are going to get the bomb? The Soviets had already secretly taken the decision to sight nuclear missiles in Cuba and any information about the date in which he was proposed to deploy similar weapons in Germany could have been great political significance. MI5 was showing intense interest in Avanov's movements. They had had confirmation from a Soviet defector that Avanov was engaged in espionage, and on 9th of August, Prufuma was tactically warned about the acquaintance about the acquaintance lost my place no one however told Macmillan and no one apparently made any direct connection with the name Christine Keeler but Prufumo took the warning seriously and immediately sent Keeler a farewell letter the affair was apparently unknown to MI5 <coughs> and might well have remained so, had it not been for Ward's incurable prattling, coupled with his continuing desire to become a man of importance. But Ward's brief encounter with... So he wanted to become a man of importance, however he saw prostitutes. But Ward's brief encounter with MI... Probably for money. But Ward's brief encounter with MI5 had gone to his head. He told a friend that he often advised the Foreign Office on security matters, he kept up his relationship with Ivanov partly in the hope of visiting Moscow, but mainly to feed his delusion that he had influence in the British corridors of power. In the following year came the Cuban Missile Crisis on the evening of Monday 22nd of October 1962. However, I note here that he saw prostitutes. Perhaps he wanted other people to come with him to see the prostitutes, to defame them. Right then, on the evening of 22nd of October 62, President Kennedy announced to the world that Soviet missiles had been installed in Cuba. <coughs> in London, Ivanov intimidated to an intimate in, in, I-N-T-I-M-A-T-E-D to a number of his contacts that he had authority to negotiate to negotiate he had authority to negotiate solution to the crisis through unofficial channels, and on Wednesday he, ap he approached Stephen Ward. Ward, of course, was carried away by Avanov's apparent confidence in his contacts. He telephoned the Foreign Office immediately without success. Frustrated, he contacted one of the patients, a backbench MP, Sir Godfrey Nicholson, who agreed to see Ivanov the same evening, and the next day passed on the proposal to a deputy undersecretary at the Foreign Office, Meanwhile, Ward was establishing other contacts. He found another conservative backbencher, William Shepherd, lunching in the Kenya coffee house at Marylebone High Street. He dropped a few famous names, mentioned Clive Dunn and Pufuma, and suggested that Shepherd should meet Ivanov. Shepherd instigated some inquiries into Ward's background and even went so far as interview with Percival Murray, the girl's former employer. He reported his findings to an acquaintance in the MI5. It was that Colonel George Wick, the Labour MP who subsequently became Lord Wick, Master Wick, sorry, was drawn almost unwittingly and most mysteriously into, an into the affair. 
He was a keen opposition spokesman on, in defence matters, in defence affairs, and had already crossed swords with Prufuma over the vassal spy case. On 11th November, Whig went for lunch, lunch to the home of his political agent. As far as he was aware, no one except his wife knew where he was. But in the early afternoon, he received a telephone call. The voice was muffled. It could have been male or female, but what it said was, Forget about Vassal. Vassal, you want to look at Profumo. What happened next could not conceivably have anything to do with Profumo. Keeler had once more left Ward's protection and was staying with a West Indian, Johnny Eggham, in Boston, Manor Road, Brentford. Left, uh, Keeler had once more left Ward's protection. So Keeler was like living with Johnny, this West Indian, right? And you know what, you know, men get up to. Another West Indian who, had, you know, West Indian who had been terrorizing her. Hang on a bit. In Boston Manor Road, Brentford, Edgecombe was involved in a fight with Lucky Gordon, another West Indian who had been terrorizing her. Eight weeks later, she was in Ward's flat in Wimpole Mews, talking with Mandy Rice Davis, who was also living there after left after. Thereafter, having left Peter Rackman. Now, these West Indian people, West Indians, they've got nothing to do with no missiles. They haven't even got any in their own country. Ed Combe arrived in the... No one wants to give them missiles. <coughs> anyway, Ed Combe arrived in a minicab in a highly agitated state and began ringing the doorbell instantly. They probably went to see the West Indian for drugs. When the two girls refused him access, he fired seven shots into the door and window and fled in the cab, and talking nonsense, obviously, to them. There's another note. They probably went to see this West Indian, just to have drugs and talking nonsense. <coughs> First reports of the shooting made the last editions of the evening papers, and Ed Coombe's arrest was announced in the daily papers the next morning, although the matter was given only slight attention. Miss Keeler, 20, a freelance actress, was visiting Miss Marilyn Davis, 18, an actress at Dr. Ward's home. But Keeler was panicking. A week later, John Lewis, former MP for West Bolton, appear, happened to meet Keeler and one of her friends, Paul Mann, a one-time racing driver. She was in an edgy mood. She was worried about what might have come at the trial of Edgecombe, who had that day appeared in court for preliminary hearing. She talked about her affairs with Prefuma and Ivanov, not realizing that Lewis had little liking for her ward. Hearing Ward's name in the breathless tale, Lewis was immediate, immediately suspicious. He managed to impress Keeler that she should contact her solicitor as soon as possible if her story was to be believed, and she, even she, posed, possessed a very damaging letter. Lewis himself approached George Wick. 